Christ our Savior, and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. May the grace of Christ our Savior, and the love of God our Father, Hey guys. Well, another day together. Um, I'm cleaning my office and uh, I have found about eight mice, uh, like computer mice, um, in drawers and things. I'm trying to sell these mice. I found a camera. I'm trying to sell a camera. I found a radar detector. I'm trying to sell that. And a uh, uh, water cooler. It <laughs> wasn't in a drawer, but I'm trying to sell that. So I've got all of these, these things I'm trying to uh, get rid of and clean up my act a bit here, clean up my office. I uh, put up these shelves you can see over my shoulder and uh, they're already full of stuff, uh, all sorts of memories. Uh, my hole-in-one that I got at Glenifer Lake. I uh, uh, was golfing with some friends. Uh, it was men's night, <clears throat> and uh, uh, it was a shotgun start, four, four men on each uh, tee box, and then uh, a horn went off, and then we, we'd all start together. So everybody starts at a different hole, and that way nobody has to wait uh, for the first hole to clear. So uh, there was a terrible wind from behind us. Um, the wind was blowing um, uh, east and north. And I had played earlier in the day, and I knew that if I could get the ball up in the air, that the wind would really take it. So I used my trusty five wood uh, that I used to always hit with. I built a very long shaft onto it. And uh, I got up in the first and I, I laced it as hard as I can hit. And uh, the first hole is uh, 365, 375 yards, I think it is. And uh, I hit the ball just as hard as I could. I got it up in the air, and you could just watch the wind take it. The ball curved just like the dog leg, just curved right around the trees, and then went went right over the trees towards the green. And one of the guys with us yelled out, I think it's on the green. And I said, no, there's no way I made it onto the green. It's in the trees. So I got in my golf cart. I went to the trees. I started looking for it. And uh, all of a sudden, one of the guys was walking across the green and he looked in the hole and he just, it was like he was electrocuted. He just shook. He said, Pastor, what kind of ball were, were you hitting? And I said, it was a top flight four. I said, it's got a little X on it. And he picked it up out of the hole and he said, it's here. It's in the hole. And uh, so I got a hole in one on a par four. Uh, in uh, uh, at Dixon and Glenifer Lake. So the next day, when I came to uh, to the golf course, there was a sign at the entrance. Somebody had built a big sign, and it said, "The Holy One 
got a hole in one on hole number one, thanks to the holiest one. <laughs> the holy one got a hole in one on hole number one, thanks to the holiest one. And uh, that sign, uh, they've got a picture of it in Glenifer Lake on the wall. And uh, I actually have a, a plaque uh, showing that I got that, that hole in one. Yeah, I was quite the celebrity for a while. I, I really was. Uh, a few days later, Stefan and I were golfing and Stefan hit a bad slice and the ball dented a fancy suburban truck. And we waited for the guys to come back. And uh, when they finally came back, uh, uh, and they found out I we made a little dent on the truck. They were all angry until they found out it was, uh, who I was. And as soon as I said my name, uh, they were all excited. Well, how did you hit that ball? And we never even had to pay for the damage on the truck. So <laughs> that hole in one saved me a whole bunch of money fixing that suburban. Anyhow, more stories. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name, knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. And I hope you will be. I see my Aunt Loretta's watching. Love you so much, Aunt Loretta. Aunt Loretta is my, my godmother. And uh, matter of fact, I have a picture of her I'm going to put up on the wall today uh, of her holding me as a baby. If she tried that now, well, it might just about end her. <laughs> she tried to pick me up now. <laughs> um, I don't have many announcements. Um, again, with the money, please get your offering in. If you are watching this and sharing in this every day, you might consider making a donation to Zion Lutheran Church just to justify uh, my doing this. And uh, I feel a little guilty sometimes uh, at how much fun I, I'm having doing this. I guy almost shouldn't get paid for having this much fun. Um, I just... I'm so enjoying getting into the Word of God uh, like I haven't maybe ever in my life. I, I don't recall a time when I felt as close to the Lord as I do right now. I, it's just in everything and studying His Word day in, day out, writing these sermons day in and day out. They, it's just amazing uh, how God is speaking through me. I... I, I hardly have any trouble thinking of words to say or words to write because it just, just comes so, so easily. Um, the Spirit of God, so amazing. And I hope that the Lord's blessing you in the same way. I, If you're with me day in and day out, I so hope that you're reading your Bibles and praying about this every day and that what you're hearing, that you put it into practice in your own life. I, I hope so. I, I hope that you're getting as much out of this as, as, as I am. Uh, but again, if you could make a donation uh, to a, the congregation, I'd appreciate it. It's Box 188, Nippon, S-O-E, 1-E-O, -E Box uh, 188, Nippon, uh, S-O-E, 1-E-O, and it's attention, uh, Karen Tran, T-R-A-N-N. -N. She's our treasurer. Karen Tran, T-R-A-N-N. -N. I'm a real televangelist now, talking about money. But anyhow, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We continue on from Psalm 139. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it so very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. So much for you just being a piece of flesh inside your mother's womb. The Lord knew you inside your mother's womb. Scripture says so right here. He knew you. You were a person from the very first moment of conception. God knew you. 
You had a soul. You were given a soul by God on that instant. You weren't just a hunk of flesh. You were a person. And God knew you. It says so. Your eyes saw my unformed body. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me. He already knew your whole life. He saw you in your mother's womb, and he already could see your whole life, what was going to come for you, what you were going to decisions you were going to make, where you were going to go. He could see it all, right from the beginning. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would take care of those who persecute me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting forever. Let us pray. How excellent, O Lord, have your thoughts been toward us and that you made us after your image. And when we were lost in sin, you sent your Son to redeem us and granted your Spirit to renew us into righteousness and true holiness. Thanks be to your mercy now and forevermore. We pray today that you will help us now, Lord, to set aside, to move away from all of the other things in our lives and just for one hour help us to give that time to you wholly and completely. And there is power. There is power in 40 or 50 of us right now gathered together in thought, in word, and in deed. There is power in a group of Christians like this, and so we pray for that power now. We pray for that power to heal. I'm thinking today of Linda in Mustadam thinking of Nancy at Hudson Bay, of George in Melfort. I'm thinking of Lorraine's friend, Darlene. And I'm thinking also of Lorraine's son-in-law, Blake. Blake is in the hospital. He has bacterial pneumonia. He has a wife and three kids, and it's very serious. Lord, we pray for healing for all of these people. We pray that you will move the hands and the minds of the doctors and the nurses to heal these people through them. If you would bring about a miracle. And we've seen you do it. We, we thank you for working with those who have cared for Rod and that he is doing so well. We remember uh, Doug Smith and all that he has had to endure. And, and we remember Doug's brother, Bob, who is so very ill, that you would heal him too. There is power when 50 Christians pray together. And so we ask in the name of Jesus, by your name, and with the power that you give us through the Spirit of God, that we unite in asking you to heal these people. In your holy name we pray. Amen. God is never beyond our reach. No one ever sought the Father and found he was not there. And no burden is too heavy to be lightened by a prayer. No problem is too intricate and so narrow and, and no sorrow that we face is too deep and devastating to be softened by his grace. No trials and tribulations are beyond what we can bear. If we share them with our Father, as we talk to him in prayer. And men of every color, every race, 
and every creed have but to seek the Father in their deepest hour of need. God asks for no credentials. He accepts us with all our flaws. He is kind and understanding, and he welcomes us just because. We are his erring children, and he loves us, every one. And he freely and completely forgives all that we have done, asking only if we're ready to follow where he leads, content that in his wisdom he will answer all our needs. I've been reading the 23rd Psalm every day, and I've been doing that because, first off, it's a psalm that we all took in school, those of us my age. Uh, it was actually included in all of our readers at school. And uh, it was always uh, uh, considered to be one of the most beautiful poetic parts of Scripture. Um, but it is also such a powerful witness to God's love and God's care for us. Today we are going to be, who can oppose us? Who could be against us? Romans 8. But for now, Psalm 23, let us together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> Let us pray. Jesus, who alone is that one good shepherd, thanks be unto you for all your spiritual and bodily benefits. Let the word of your salvation dwell among us richly and suffer not that trusty staff, the word of your promise to be taken from us. And when the shadow of death spreads once upon us, conduct us safely to the fold of the perfected saints, the tabernacle not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Amen. Uh, I don't know whether you've ever seen one, but uh, if you want to buy yourself a beautiful book, uh, this is called the Concordia Psalter. And it has the psalms, and each psalm is accompanied by a prayer and a little uh, devotion. Uh, and it's just just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book to own. And uh, Concordia Psalter. Romans 8, 31 through 39. I see, Linda, you're watching. I think... Either Matthew, Jeff, Michelle for sure, I think, her confirmation verse was Romans 8, 31 through 39. Maybe Matthew's was too. Can't remember. But uh, uh, all of my confirmants uh, were always expected to memorize uh, Romans 8, 31 through 39 for the simple reason that it is the most powerful words of scripture to support us that I know of. When I was a boy, uh, it, it, and it always blows me away to think that while I was a boy living just a few miles north of the American border, that there was a war going on south of that border. I do not remember on a single occasion ever considering a war in the States, uh, that Vietnam was going on. I did not know about it. I didn't care about it. I was a child. I honestly don't remember it at all. But years later, I remember reading somewhere about uh, uh, a pilot who had been shot down and he was kept in a cell, isolated, 
and he had taken a rock and as a confirmand in, in church, uh, in, in uh, uh, his church, Lutheran church, he had been asked, forced <laughs> to memorize Romans 8, 31 through 39. And he took that rock and he carved the words on the wall, uh, Romans 8, 31 through 39. And by doing so, I remember him uh, telling us all that it had given him such strength and encouragement to read every day those words carved on his wall. And he'd actually memorized a lot of scripture. And I guess years later when the, the cell was pictured, the walls were covered with uh, scripture that he had memorized, including the 23rd Psalm. When I uh, go on to TV and I see a television program moving in the direction of introducing Christianity into the picture, I think it's time now to laugh at the stupid Christians because we are all just a joke. When a Christian is part of the plot, the purpose they serve is usually to get a laugh at the expense of how naive, foolish we are, or, or morally uh, corrupt that we are. We're, we're all uh, money-grubbing, hypocritical, child-molesting, uh, misogynistic jerks. And uh, we, we uh, all hate homosexuals, and we want all the Muslims in the world to die. That's the way they portray Christians. And of course, none of those things are true. We're portrayed as ignorant, uneducated, socially backward, incompetence, blundering, life clinging to foolish beliefs and notions, stemming our own uh, needs and wants for the sake of something that is just baloney. Now, if they laughed at Jews a cry would go up that they were anti-Semitic and there would be rallies and maybe even marches against them for being so foolish. And if they dared to make fun of uh, the Muslims or Muhammad, well, the whole Middle East would erupt. As a matter of fact, they blame was it, was it Benghazi on a comic strip that somebody wrote about Muhammad. Yet Judaism and Christianity and Islam share a common set of moral values. We do. We share the same kind of morality. We believe very strongly in a strong family unit of a man and a woman. We believe very strongly in morality around property rights and the way we treat each other. Um, we share a lot in the way in the area of morality. If our ideas are out of step, certainly then theirs are as well, yet we're made fun of and they are not. That's frustrating. And yet it is precisely what Scripture says was going to happen. It seems that New Testament Christianity is always going to be the target of those who are opposed to the kingdom of God, those who are intent on trying to establish the kingdom of man, try to discourage true Christianity by the use of one of the most powerful weapons of all, and that is ridicule. The more that we can be poked at and what we believe made to look foolish, the more freedom that individuals have to do what is wrong, what is evil. And it has a very real effect on us. It produces a sense of intimidation. We feel a certain fear and embarrassment before those who might scoff at us. I'll tell you, this collar I wear, it's you know, in, in this circle, with all of you, it means a lot, and I wear it proudly. But if I walk into a bar or a lounge, and by the way, I haven't been in a bar for 40 years, but if I ever did, this, I'm sure, would be a point that someone would ridicule. 
Christians have been persecuted since Jesus' day. Here in Romans, we have a powerful message about facing the opposition of the world. We need to experience the power of this message. I, I'm, I'm not fooling. This, this message can help you like nothing else. When you feel like you aren't worth anything, when you are deeply depressed, when your life just does not seem to be working, these words can lift you up out of the muck and the mire. And I'm going to ask five questions that I see in this text. Five questions. The first is, and by the way, all five have the same answer. The first question is, who can oppose us? Who can oppose us? It says in verse 31, What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Actually, the implication here is that since God is for us, what difference does it make who is against us? And if you think about it, how true is that? Now, while we might be intimidated, we shouldn't be because we have God Almighty walking at our side. And maybe their knees don't bow today, but they will. Their knees one day will bow. The God who loves us, the God who died for us, the God who is with us is on our side. Now, I don't know what your experience was like in school, but... I skipped a grade and uh, I ended up um, coming to Shonovan uh, as a boy, going into grade seven, uh, much younger than the other kids in my class. And they had decided to experiment that year and they had uh, three classes of grade seven students and they put all of the guys who had failed and the troublemakers into one class, all their bad eggs in one basket. And because we moved late, there was no room for me in the other classes. And so I got put into that class. And I'll tell you, they threw meat into hungry dogs. Because man, did they abuse me. I was thrown downstairs to see how many steps I'd touch before I crashed at the bottom. They'd, hung, they'd hang me out of a window and then bet how long I could hang before I had to drop. They'd destroy my bike and they'd wreck my everything. They, they, they were just horrible. But I soon learned that if I could find a friend who was older and bigger and tougher than all those bullies, I had something that I could use to get by them. And as long as I had that friend with me, I could walk right through that group and they wouldn't touch me. As long as I had that friend with me, I was safe. Because who would, who would oppose me? Who would be so stupid to try to oppose me? I've got this fellow with me and he's much bigger and much stronger than all of you. It didn't matter how strong I was because the guy who was with me was much stronger. If you mess with that guy, you mess with me, he would say. We must begin to live in the realization that God is for us. It's more than a theological statement. It's, it's something that we can know because of what God has done for us throughout history. God didn't just say, I love you. He didn't just do it with words. He showed us. Look what it says in verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him for up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? So he who would not spare his own son. How much is God for us? He's for us so much that when he came in time to give up his most priceless possession, his Jesus my Stephan, my Annie, his only begotten son, my son, my daughter, he did so without reservation. He gave them, he gave him up. <laughs> he didn't spare his own son. Now seeing that, Q 
Can you imagine a love that great? I certainly can't. I, I would never have the strength to give up my son. I, I, I couldn't do it. Now, I would gladly take the place for my son. I, I would gladly give my own life for my son. I would without, without hesitation. And I, I'll bet you every single one of you would give your life without question for your children. How much is God for us? He was willing to give up Jesus for you and me. He loves us that much. You know, it just doesn't register in my brain the notion of giving up my, my child. I can't go there. So what does it matter if all the world lines up against you? Sometimes you might feel intimidated, but you shouldn't be. Because God is on your side. Who can oppose you? The answer is nobody. Second question, who can accuse you? Well, the world loves to accuse Christians. They love to accuse Christians. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies, verse 33 says. Who accuses you? Well, Satan does. In the book of Job, we see Satan, not in hell, suffering but walking into the very courts of God. We see a conversation taking place between God and Satan, as if it occurs every day in heaven. In Revelation, Satan is called the accuser of the brethren, whom he accuses day and night before the throne of God. Satan accuses. Satan stands before God's throne to accuse you. He brings to God's attention every flaw, every sin, every failing you ever had. He tells, them, he tells God all about what a failure you are, what a sinner you are. All of your shortcomings, every weakness that you have, Satan accuses you of to Almighty God. Who else does? Well, the world does. Just turn on the TV and listen to the news. Today we are in uh, Newport News, uh, Saskatchewan. And uh, we just found out that a Catholic priest has been accused of molesting a child. Well, as soon as we hear that on the news, we right away feel the reverberations of that all the way down the line. That somehow, because one priest molested a child, we are all guilty. Because a number of priests, Anglican, Catholic, Lutheran, whoever, abuse some children in some residential schools somewhere. All the schools are rotten. All the people that ever did anything in those schools is bad. And every Christian are hypocritical child molesters. And you don't have to think too hard to agree with what I'm saying to you. What they don't say about that Catholic priest is that there are a half a million Catholic priests. Half a million. And then you can add another four million nuns, brothers, deacons, monks of all sorts. So you have one, two, ten, fifty priests who have been caught doing something bad. But consider the number of people involved. The church isn't corrupt. The church is amazing. A few individuals made terrible choices. But so very few when you put it up against what the Catholic Church is. Do you know that the Catholic Church has 1.3 billion members? 1.3 billion members, and that was in, that was in 2012. 1.3 billion people say they are Roman Catholic. Who else accuses us? Well, the world does. And the world accuses us and does not, they do not, the world does not consider for one moment that we are all not guilty simply by association. 
Many may accuse us, but the point is, in the end, again, what does it matter? Does it matter who accuses us? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? The answer to this question, again, is nobody. Nobody. Because we have God, our Father, with us. And so what difference does it make? Bring on your accusation, Satan. You can stand before the throne of God and point out every single one of my faults and it's all fine and good. You can spend hours doing it because in the end, Jesus will step forward and say, Lord, I want you to know that yes, Randy has done all of these things, but it matters not because I died for every one of those sins. My blood has washed him clean. So Satan can accuse all he wants. But I have been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. And I'm good to go. And the third question is, who can condemn us? Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died? More than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. The only one who can condemn us is the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is revealed in Scripture as the one and only judge who will come again to judge the living and the dead. And we need fear no other judgment, and we need not fear that judgment either, because if we believe in Jesus Christ and trust in him, we are told, we are promised a place in heaven who can separate us. Again, nobody. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword, or, or COVID-19? Who will separate us? Will trouble, or hardship, now, these are all emotional things. We feel them deeply in our spirits. Our minds and our hearts are troubled when we're in distress and we experience hardship and we feel like we're being persecuted. But most of the persecution that exists today, at least in this country, is not physical persecution. It's the persecution we feel when we're ridiculed, when we're laughed at, when we're scoffed at, when we're, when we're rebuffed. It happens on the inside. Is this going to separate you? No. Who can separate us? Nobody. Who can condemn us? Nobody. In verse 38 and 39, he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The power of that statement. Nothing can separate you from your God. He takes you and he holds you in the small of his hand and no one can snatch you from him. Satan can go gargle concrete for all we care because his accusations mean nothing. His condemnation means nothing. So, he includes quite a bit there. If you die, death has no power. I heard of someone who didn't want the usual dates born and died on his tombstone. His tombstone. He wanted born and then born again. And transferred, <laughs> born, born again and transferred <laughs> from this life to the next. We don't really die. We, we, we always say that, you know, your life has come to an end. No, it hasn't. Your life has come to a beginning. You're just, you're just starting out. Hey, Petey. Who can be against us? Nobody. Who can condemn us? Nobody. Now there's another fear which is real for Christians, and that's the fear of life. Can life separate us? The challenge is not merely to be ready to die, the challenge is to be ready to live. The world with all of its temptations, the pressures, 
the demands that press upon us, sometimes we're threatened by life itself. We're threatened by our very own lives. We look Satan square in the eye and say, Satan, do your worst. You can't separate us from God. But we turn around and add pressure to our own lives, separating ourselves from God by the things that occupy our time and our lives. Your present situation can't separate you from God's love. You may be struggling with your current situation. Perhaps you aren't where God wants you to be in your spiritual life. You've fallen back on your commitment to Christ. Maybe the pressure of this time, this, this virus that's going around, is causing you a tremendous amount of distress. Maybe you're driven to despair. Perhaps you're not even aware of how to get out of the rut that you're in, the hole that is so deep that you've dug or that you have fallen into. Habit patterns have become so strong in your life, and although you'd like to break some of these things, you've tried and you've failed time and time again. <clears throat> the guy who says quitting drinking isn't hard at all, I've done it a thousand times. Quitting smoking isn't tough. I've, I've quit a thousand times. It's not hard at all. You might be in a hard situation in your life right now, and it might look very bleak. I had a fellow I talked to the other day whose life was coming apart at the seams. His children were fighting with him. They, they actually called him names. His family, his brothers and his sisters have written him off. They don't speak to him anymore. His wife is considering leaving him. He lost his job because of this virus. He can't figure out how to work the government loops in order to get his money to, for help. He smokes. He takes drugs. And he's an alcoholic. And he's about as low as a man can be. And so where do you start? Here is a fellow the world didn't condemn. The world didn't accuse. He did all of this to himself. I didn't get as fat as I am by some form of uh, osmosis. <laughs> I got this fat because I ate too much. We are our own worst enemies sometimes. So how do we dig our way out of it? Well, we do so by looking to our God. If we have God on our side, who can be against us? If we acknowledge that, the bullies of the world can't take us on because we have God walking beside us. God can rescue us from even the darkest situation. And I know that that can sound so flippant to the fellow who's suffering like this fellow I talked about is. But the good news is that not only can he, but he does. He does rescue us from the pit. When Martin Luther was suffering so much with depression and he thought his life was finished, it all started for him when his father confessor taught him to say these few words. Father, I am yours. Save me. My God, I am yours. Save me. When we can say those words and mean them wholly and completely, we take our first step out of the pit. This man I talked to the other day, I told him about that, and he has begun to do, to say those words. Whenever he feels down, whenever he feels like he's being counted out, he says those words out loud, Father, I am yours, save me. 
and he does. Things present cannot separate us, and neither can the future. How many of you live in fear of what might happen tomorrow? Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. He wasn't talking about planning for the future. He was talking about not having anxiety, not being immobilized by fear of what might happen tomorrow. The what ifs. What if this happens? What if that happens? When you do that, you're suffering for, thi from, for things that haven't even happened yet. What a lie the devil has when he can convince us to worry about something that hasn't even happened. The future ought not to hold any threat to us because we trust in God who is present in our lives right now. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will look after itself. Who then can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? And the answer to it is nobody and nothing who can defeat us. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And the implied question is, who can defeat us? The answer again is nobody. We are more than conquerors. The term in the Greek is hyper-conqueror. We are super-conquerors. We are abundant conquerors through Christ. We need to go forth as the church of Jesus Christ with our heads held high, knowing that we are conquerors, beyond conquerors, abundant. He is the king. We are in his kingdom, and we are the king's children, princes and princesses of the Lord. The world ridicules Christianity because it senses intuitively the real threat that the gospel has the changes that can happen because of it. And just like the Pharisees hated Jesus, the world hates him too because he doesn't care about the rules. He cares about the people. We need to go forth recognizing that it's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit. We are more than conquerors. Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And I'd like to say that in the affirmative that the church of God will prevail against the gates of hell because I believe that is precisely what he had in mind. This isn't a picture of the church in retreat. The faithful few holding out to the end, the Alamo of Christianity. As we take the, man, the commands of Jesus Christ seriously and walk in the power of the Spirit, we will find ourselves to be these super abundant conquerors, changing lives and glorifying God for what he's done for us. Who can oppose us? Nobody. If God is for us, who can accuse us? Nobody. Jesus has forgiven us. Who can condemn us? Nobody that matters. God has already justified us. So who can separate us? Nobody and nothing. God loves us. Who can defeat us? Nobody. God has already given us victory, washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Your sins are gone. And God remembers them no more. As I heard once, I have read the back of the book, and we win. Amen. I have read the back of the book, and we win. What a glorious day that will be when Satan and Og and Magog cast into the fire. I, I know that it sounds terrible, but I almost feel sorry for them. An eternity in the fires of hell. Oh. I'm so, so thankful that my Jesus has taken that 
out of the mix for us as Christians. We need not fear that at all. He died to take away my sin so that I need not fear that. I only need worry about the color of the sheets on the windows in my mansion in heaven. <laughs> Let us pray. Most holy God, you are the source of all goodness, the source of wisdom and mercy and life. If we never before knew how much we need you, we know now. Father, you have given yourself as Christ on the cross for me and for the whole world. I have been many things in my life. And I'd been with you, if I had been with you at your crucifixion, I might have acted as did the people of that time. I probably would have contributed to your pain. In spite of this, I have been self-righteous and quick to boast of the commandments I keep, quick to condemn the transgressions of others and slow to forgive them. This is who I have been and now I have lived my life and I am in need of your grace and I am so in need of your forgiveness. Forgive me, Lord, and love me, and help me by your Spirit to follow you joyfully. Fill me with your love so that I might love others. Heavenly Father, put people in my way that I might give them aid or share with them you. For all these things, Heavenly Father, we say thank you, and we love you so. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us forever and ever, forevermore. Amen. Well, that's about it for today. Um, please remember to get your offering in so that we can keep going. If you don't go to my congregations here, uh, uh, please support this ministry if you are able. Uh, Box 188, Nepoan, S-O-E-1-E-O. -E -E and uh, please send your donations to Karen Tran and uh, help us to keep this all all working and uh, you got your own churches too. Uh, I sure hope that you're sending your offering into your own congregations. Uh, Pastor Russ in Dixon, what an amazing man. Uh, you got a good guy. I sure hope you're supporting him. And uh, I don't know who's at Radisson right now. Um, I'm sure that whoever is there uh, is doing an amazing job, I'm sure. Um, uh, please make sure that your congregations get your offerings so that they all can keep running keep keep going i think that's it so thank you so much and uh we'll see you all uh what day is this this is wednesday so thursday uh my congregation is saying they're demanding that i take a break uh um uh so i uh i better do that I, i'm going to take uh, uh let's say friday and saturday off uh, it's not really off. I'm going to just be coming to the office and writing sermons. So, <laughs> but, but at least it gives me a bit of a break. So Friday and Saturday, I'm going to take off. So tomorrow we will do the last of the Romans 8 sermons. Oh, it's, so, it's so exciting, isn't it? Tomorrow's the last of the Romans 8 sermons. And, uh, and then we'll take a break. And then Sunday morning at 11 will be the next time that we're together. Um, what a blessing you are to me. Thank you so much for joining in. When I see your names come up here, Jim and Linda Lougheed, 
I can't believe it. You, this is so much fun. <clears throat> Do you know that there's a hospital in Tijuana, Mexico, that plays my messages over their TVs? In, in the hospital. I, I, I was blown away. One of the fellows, the doctors who helped me, uh, likes my messages, and so they, they're played over the TV, their, their little system they have in the hospital, to the rooms. And people who I'm sure cannot understand a word of English look at this old fat guy talking on their TVs. And uh, <laughs> how, how cool is that, that I, I can say that that is going on? Um, so a anyhow... Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you all so much. I, I really do. Oh, so many friends, family members, dear, dear, dear friends. And uh, thank you for letting me do this. Oh, I'm having so much fun. God bless you. See you tomorrow. Uh, have a great day. Love you. Bye-bye.